Hello, 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 members. I couldn't be more excited. I am here with a few legends who created a whiskey. I'm sure you can see from the title how much we love this whiskey. I am with Sarah Burgess, the head of whiskey making at the Lakes Distillery, and I am here with Kirsty Taylor, one of the directors from the Lakes Distillery, and both of these people are fundamental getting this incredible whiskey in our hands. And it has been a heck of a journey. Guys, how are you? We're great, thank you. Good evening. Good morning over here. Good evening to you guys over there. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having us, Seamus. It's, uh, it's incredible to see you both. It's incredible to get a little sneak peek into the whiskey lab. It's nice to see a cleaner one than ours. <laughs> We need to be organised in here, Shimas. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not at all surprised, especially some of the meticulous kind of approach to your whiskey making um, that we see from you, Sarah. But um, we have a really good opportunity tonight. I mean, I think for a lot of people, almost everyone watching along, this is going to be the first time they've had an expression from the Lakes Distillery, and I'm certain from most of the feedback we've seen, it won't be the last. So. Members, before we get into anything, I want you to fire off in the comments, throw the hard questions as always, but also I think we've all loved this whiskey, so don't be afraid to pepper us with a few ideas for maybe a future release as well. Would that be fair to say, guys? Oh, I, I love it. I love the real feedback and some thoughts and ideas for future releases. That's great. Oh, fantastic. Now that you have asked for it, you will receive it. I am very, very proud of our members. We love to tell you what we love uh, and we love to drink the whiskies that we love as well. But look, it's incredible to have you both here, but I think we're in this bit of a unique opportunity and most of our members, they've read the packing letter, they've read the write-ups, they've, they've enjoyed a month of seeing what the Lakes Distillery is, but to hear it from the two of you is going to be amazing. Kirsty, if, if you could, we'd love to kind of go through the history of the Lakes Distillery a little bit. Absolutely. So. Uh, I guess if I go right back to the very beginning, uh, we were founded by a gentleman called Paul Curry, who you may have come across before. Paul grew up in the Scotch whiskey industry. His dad was MD of Shivas for 25 years or something. And when um, Paul's dad uh, retired from Shivas, Paul and his father and his brother Andrew set up uh, Aaron Distillery, who you probably all know. Um, and then they sold that out in the early 2000s. And his dad truly then at that stage wanted to retire and Paul wanted to do one more distillery. And despite growing up in the Scotch whiskey industry, Paul is as stereotypically English as they come. He is the archetypal English country gentleman. So he wanted to do this last distillery or this next distillery in England. And it was actually his dad, Harold Curry, who sort of, advised him I guess that you know um, if he was going to do a distillery in England that the Lake District National Park was actually a perfect location to be creating um, you know his legacy distillery I guess and I guess what what's the reason why well there's a clue in the name the lakes we're up in the northwest of England as you can see there apologies you'd be amazed how many people don't know where we are on this little island um, but we're up in the northwest. We're literally about 40 miles south of the Scottish border. We're in the Lake District National Park, which is the UK's largest national park. We get about 19 million visitors a year. So Harold Curry, Paul's father, was like, look, 19 million visitors a year is very helpful when you're trying to build a new brand. Um, so from the very get-go, the distillery was built with, you know, a visitor experience in mind. And this was before the day of, you know, great whiskey tourism that we're seeing today. Um, a clue in the name, the lake, we have a plentiful supply of water here. Um, and then also we've got a similar climate to sort of Isla on the west coast of Scotland. Um, it's called an oceanic climate. So great conditions for maturing whiskey and well-proven. So that's why Paul... Um, set up in the Lake District. Our distillery is an old Victorian um, dairy farm. It was built in the 1860s. It's an absolutely beautiful building. Here's some pictures of prior to the renovation. So it was built in the 1860s. It was derelict for about 30 years. It was abandoned in the 1980s. 
And then Paul discovered the building uh, in an auction in about 2010. Uh, 2011, he established the business, he bought the premises, um, and then went through a very, very thorough, that's interesting, oh, sorry guys, our fire alarm just went off, but we don't normally have a test at this time of day, but it's disappeared, so we'll just hang on in there. So, um, yeah, the three-year renovation process was required. Um, because we're in the National Park, because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site, the planning department locally literally enforced us to take every stone down brick by brick. They were all labelled. And then to make sure it was compliant with modern manufacturing practices and everything else, it was put back together brick by brick. So what we have now is our brand home that we're incredibly proud of. It's a beautiful building. It is small, but we like to say perfectly formed. Um, but that's what I think is special because lots of people build a distillery but we found a home and we fitted a distillery which makes it really special yeah on the image is there that beautiful quatrefoil and that quatrefoil is seen all the way around the distillery and that's what's echoed on the bottom of our bottle so this quatrefoil logo is absolutely everywhere and part of our very foundation yeah, and so there's 20, as Sarah says, there's 26 of these quatrefoils around the distillery. It's an old, you, you may already know this, but it's an old Celtic um, symbol that represents faith, hope, luck and love. It's like a four-leaf clover. It's used a lot in architecture. It's used in various different religions as a symbol as well. And we just thought, you know, number one, it's truly authentic to our brand home. And secondly, in terms of what it stands for, in terms of faith, hope, luck and love, you know, a great sort of emblem for and logo for our, our brand going forward into the future. So that's the history behind where that came from. And those quatrefoils that are embedded in the stonework around the distillery were literally things like ventilation windows for the old cow sheds. Some of them were decorative but a lot of them were very functional in part, uh, uh, as part of that kind of Victorian farm when it was built back in, back in the 19, uh, 1860s. So that's us. Um, we have a second founder who joined Paul in uh, about 2012, a guy called Nigel Mills. Uh, Nigel is very much the kind of, dare I say, accountant behind the scenes. Um, and then we started distilling in December 2015. So we're actually coming up to our 10 year anniversary of distilling this year, which we're all very much excited about. And with that will come 2014, sorry. Yeah. Oh, 2014. Yeah. It, it was the 15th of December. That's where the confusion came. Yeah, 2014. We are now in 2024. Thank yeah. you. Um, 10 years distilling this year. So we're excited about that and we'll be celebrating that um, and, you know, that has enabled us to um, sort of get the distillery settled down. But, you know, within that innovation is a big part of what we believe in. And so Sarah and her team are constantly pushing those boundaries within the stillhouse itself, let alone within what happens in the studio. Um, and you know we will be moving to a position later on this year where we we're in we're at a stage now where we're able to start introducing some core permanent skews into our range, which we haven't had up until this point in time. So that's a, a step forward for us as well. So then, part, as part of our history, Sarah, bless her, very kindly joined us. So uh, we're into our second whiskey maker now at the lake. So. Um, our whiskey maker previously was a gent called Davil Gandhi. Um, Davil joined us in 2016, uh, and then Sarah joined us. Davil last year or year before last decided he wanted to go off and do more sort of freelance consultancy work, and Sarah joined us in December. January 23. January 23. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I think. Now there's something quite incredible about you two, obviously, Deval and yourself, Sarah, in that you both come from a very similar background. Um, I would love to dig through that a little bit for the members as we start to hear your story. Well, mine's a lot less interesting than Sarah, so let me get mine out of the way quickly, and then Sarah is much more interesting for, for your audience. So 
My, I've sort of primarily got a commercial background in sales and marketing, specifically in brand building. Um, I started in the spirits industry far too many years ago uh, to mention in a business called Allied de Mec, which most of you are far too young to even remember. But at the time, Allied de Mec were the second largest kind of um, global spirits portfolio owner, um, second to United Distillers. So back in the day, it was United Distillers, then Allied de Mec, then IDV. Then what happened was United Distillers and IDV merged and became UDV, and then UDV bought Guinness and became the Diageo that we know and love today. And Allied de Mec, uh, we had brands at the time. We had Glendronach in our portfolio, Lefroy, uh, Ballantines was obviously our big global kind of power brand. Um, as well as a, a wider portfolio of spirits. Um, and then Allied Mech actually got sold to Perno Records and that, that portfolio got broken up and the whole spirits world is now very different to what it was back in the day when I started. Um, sub subsequent to that, I've done various roles internationally working for consumer goods businesses in sales and marketing. But Sarah's background is much more interesting. So you... Talk about your background, Sarah. So this year will be my 27th year working in the whiskey industry. Obviously, you can't tell not wood as I would have been working in the whiskey industry for that long. Um, so I started 27 years ago working in Diageo. And I started as a tour guide in the distillery. So being paid to chat to people and talk about whiskey. And that's where the passion for whiskey started. So starting at Cardew Distillery, that distillery is the only distillery in Scotland to be pioneered for women. So for me, females working in the whiskey industry was a perfectly natural and normal thing. Um, and Diageo have an excellent programme for investing in development and talent within the business. So they provided me with lots of development opportunities and sponsored my degree and technical qualifications. So I started with a seasonal tour guide, which is probably the, on the bottom end of the job scale at Distillery, and managed to work my way right up to senior site manager. So when I left Diageo, I had the top job at Distillery. And mm. um, so I worked in and around Speyside, so many distilleries, um, Athrask, Dulhuin, Ben Rinnis, Glen Spey, Glen Elgin, oh, Krag and more like so many. Um, and then I went up to Climlish and Brora, then moved down to Glen Kinchy Distillery, and then moved to the west of Scotland to Oban Distillery. Mm -hmm. And whilst I was in Oban, I thought, right, I've now worked in health and safety, I've done warehousing, I've done distillery, I've done visitor centres. What is it in the industry now that I can do and where can I get challenge? So I always knew that I had a good sense of smell, um, but I did not know was that going to be enough to become a whiskey maker or blender as some companies term it. Mm. So an opportunity came up at the McAllen Distillery and I was successful with that role and became their whiskey maker. Mm. Uh, I stayed with McAllen for a number of years. And during that time, I was promoted to lead whiskey maker. So looking after the team at McAllen and the production of all of the whiskies and had an amazing time. I mean, I can, from my garden, I can see the warehouses at McAllen. So I didn't actually ever think I'd leave there. But... <laughs> The spirit of creativity and excitement. The opportunity came up to come down here to the lakes, and it, English whiskey has much more opportunity than Scotch whiskey. And I can't, mm. as a proud Scottish person, I'm actually saying this. <laughs> but there's there's fun and exploration. You know, there are more opportunities for experimentation inside the distillery, and more specifically opportunities for the use of exotic wood types of maturation. And that's where, as, as you and all of the members will know, between 60 and 80% of your flavor comes from the cask and from maturation. So looking at these exotic species and what flavor profiles we'll be able to create and how much fun our future additions from the lakes will be 
because of the viewpoints and how completely different. Of course, I I think this is a really good opportunity, and Sarah, this is very much a, a question for you, a two parter. One, if you could take us through, I guess, one, what makes the lake spirit so well, it's it's very of itself. There's there's very few spirits I think I've had that have this wonderful character to it. And then two, what makes the total lakes house style when you involve the casks into that equation? So in the distillery, what we are aiming to produce for the bulk of the time is a fruity cereal character. Mm. So that fruity cereal character, we create that from our mashing style, creating a nice clear wort. We have a very long fermentation and a very, very slow distillation. So that is, that's really our secret to our fruity cereal character. But that creates, that is the very beginning, the foundation of that layers of flavour. And then for us, we operate a process that's very similar to the world of cognac, very unusual for whiskey, called Delavage. So, you know, working through the studio, we'll work through samples and listen to what that particular cask has got to say and then make a choice on which direction we want that to be pushed and which cask type it moves into. Mm. And because we've got the opportunity for the exotic wood types, we've also got the forms of French, American, European oak, some of the new world oak that are coming through, the Colombian oaks, Hungarian oaks, um, the, the, the golden oak of Mizunara, but it's just so difficult to find. Um, and then obviously all of the season possibility, that variation in toasting temperatures, allowing all of the um, cellulose, vanillins, tannins, all to be at the correct point for that ideal conversation and the creation of more flavour. So I mm. think in terms of the lake's real house style, it's about that layers of flavour and that mouth coating. There's a there's almost an opulence to our whiskey. Absolutely. I think, and I'm going to ask you a question that's very unabashedly coming from me. I haven't seen this one come through from the members yet, but I have to ask it. Even though in a lot of ways, sherry is a quintessential part of your whiskey's DNA in a lot of ways, you were mentioning a lot there about kind of wood treatments and virgin oaks and new oak species. Are you seeing the industry and are you seeing whiskey in general being improved by going in that direction? Are you getting new flavours? Uh, so for me, new flavours and creativity is an improvement, regardless of the results, because it's about the exploration and experimentation. So I see that as a massive positive. You know, for, for the lakes, you know, our, our house style is based around sherry and we won't deviate from that in, like Kirsty was talking about, in the introduction of our permanent products, they will be very much in the house style. But mm. the additions, which, you know, Voyage that's come over to you guys is a whiskey maker's addition. The additions are, they're like the playground for me as whiskey maker. That's where we can take distillery experimentation, different cast type experimentation and create something really quite unusual and different from the core house style. And you know, as a maker, having that opportunity to do something new and fresh all the time, that's really what keeps me interested. Well, I've, I've got a question here from Peter Ryan and it's while we're still on the distillery side of the equation and it, it's to the terroir and the location, is there anything special about the water that sets the lakes apart from other distilleries? So lots of people always ask about the water and it's a, a really obvious and question and I understand why people ask it because as a whiskey distillery you've only got three ingredients water, malted barley and yeast mm. but actually how important is that water mm. clean and potable is what you're really looking for but is there a flavour influence to it with the amount of heat that is added through the mashing process and then ultimately in the distillation that boiling of your base water, there's very little influence of water in your final product. So very little as in like zero. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, 
I'm thrilled <laughs> to get some succinctity on that because I'm sure I've been as, in as many whiskey tastings as I'm sure you have where there'll be quite a diatribe about hard water and soft water and how water runs through peat bogs and things like that. I, uh, I'm i very happy. Like the, the type of water you've got for your distillery will cause you an issue. Like if you've got too hard water, you're spending a lot more money on chemicals and cleaning. The water and the importance of water with whiskey is for me, when you want to add water to your whiskey, you want that to be the purest water. So mm. when you're in your whiskey down, if you live in an area where the water from the tap is heavily chlorinated and you've spent the money that you've spent buying a great whiskey like this buy yourself a bottle of mineral water please mm. that's, um, that's also a tested on this side of the world we recommend it from our whiskey lab as well as part of our testing process and all the draft so i couldn't agree more yeah. um don't want to get fluoride in the water if you're used to australian taps um but I, uh, I have to ask one last question before we really get into the whiskey, and it's more from your blending philosophy, obviously influenced by years of incredible Diageo blending distilleries, and especially Macallan, where you were helming Macallan at a time where there was a little more cast experimentation. Has that kind of production approach and the philosophy influenced what you've brought to lengths and kind of succeeded on from uh, Duval's also Macallan influence there as well? I think for, for anyone, regardless of the steps that you take in your career, you don't forget what you already what you already know. You don't come into a new place and say, okay, let's just ditch all of that and start with a blank canvas. So whether you want it or not, that experience is there. And I think part of that experience helps you to grow and understand how specific cast types will work together. Mm. And you know, part of the biggest joy that I've got right now uh, we have a whiskey analyst here at the distillery called Grace Gorton, and I'm currently training Grace to become a whiskey maker for the lakes. So that will be something to look out for in the future, Grace's first whiskey release. Oh, incredible, incredible. That's very exciting. I'm sure there'll be an addition with uh, Grace's name on it. In the um, but speaking of additions, we are here to talk about this incredible whiskey, and I would love it if you could walk the members through what your philosophy was a little bit on putting this terrific bottle together. Because I have to just say before you jump in that this was one of those samples and I told you at the time, but I'm happy to tell all the members that the first sample that came across the desk, it was already a tick, tick, tick from the entire panel. And then it was more just down to detail and it's, it's almost rare to get it perfect on, on a first run. So anything that ever leaves the, the studio, in, in my mind, what we've done is we've done, we've had that constant strive for perfection. Mm. So what I thought when we were having our first call, that it was just purely for me to run through tasting notes. I did not appreciate that it had the potential to be a feedback session. So I was glad that it was just all text because I'm not sure quite how that would have gone. <laughs> I got to admire the confidence there and I'm not mad at it perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would love if you could take the chance to walk the members through how did you put this whiskey together so when i understood the brief that we were going to create something for an amazing whiskey club on the other side of the world i thought right what what does australia stand for what does it mean what's my interpretation and that's the reason why I look to so many different cask types, because I, you know, it, for me it felt like so many um, different nationalities have all moved to Australia, made that their home. It's like a melting pot of culture, and that's why I wanted to include American and European oak, have mm. Pinox, Calvados, Oloroso. And the red wine was really a nod to the wine making industry in Australia. So when you take so many different cask influences, it's really easy for one of those influences to shout louder than the others. But I mm. think actually what we have got here is a bit more like an orchestra. Each one of them gets to play their tune and it I think it works really well together. Um, 
I, I was actually drinking this over the weekend, which you can you can kind of see by how much is in the bottle now. Um, <laughs> yeah, you beat me. You beat me. <laughs> to be fair, that's not my first one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, I think with with this, especially for us at this time of the morning, at forty nine percent, it is quite strong. And that was another thing that went through my thought process. When I make a whiskey, I will then look at that whiskey from the natural cask strength right down to 46%. Because we are a natural, non-chill filtered product, we cannot go to less than 46 because I think no one wants to see the spider's web haze in the bottle. It's not so appealing. Um, so I look at that one percent increments, and then determine where where is it right. And normally you get quite a straightforward peak, and this is where your strength will land. But for this at forty nine, it is quite strong. I considered the, your climate and thought, well, most people are probably going to add water to this or potentially ice, and the whiskey reacts very very well to that addition. Definitely. Really releases all of those flavours. And, you know, Kirsty and I both have got this fabulous glassware sent from you, Seamus. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the, the baked apples, the dried fruits that come through on the nose of this, that hints of licorice, the hints of dark chocolate, all mm. just like of what's a way to come when you taste this whiskey. Absolutely. Hopefully, all of you that are watching have got a wee drama void. If not, we'll just keep talking about it, dear. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you didn't, I feel bad for you because there's not one bottle in the country that you can get your hands on. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, you're not wrong about how that delivers on the palate. I think that the thing, my immediate thought, flashback to when that first sample arrived was not only is the flavor delivering on the nose but also the texture it has that wonderful viscosity the oiliness kind of starting at the front and just gradually getting chewier and oilier as it gets further back and that richness carries on you know the the dried fruits the fresh fruits the baked figs all of that just kind of dancing around in the mouth the orange oil, that sort of treacly licorice, the sweetness, it, it rolls from one flavour into the next. And I think that was where talking about it being an orchestra, that's just the, the, the tune of it, the dance of it almost going over the tongue. Mm. And then, you know, I, I think there's a kind of medium to long finish, and I really enjoy that chocolate richness that comes through the back. Yeah, and I'd say this is actually a really good opportunity for any members who are less familiar with kind of these bolder, chewier whiskies. that there's this wonderful kind of method for enjoying a lot of these things that's to exhale with long breaths as as that's on the back of your palate and you'll get the rolling sugars that Sarah's touching on there, that kind of fuller mouth feel, the warming feeling coming through your sinuses. And really that's where you're starting to see those sherry casks and those French oak spices, right? Yeah. And I think so when I just added water to the whiskey because, you know, it is only 8.30 a.m. So it's a little early even by my standards. Um, but I think with the water addition, there's a almost a honey roasted nut comes through on the palate for me. There's a savoury element to the sweet richness. Absolutely. But I think all it, it also heightens the berry note at the same time and it still exactly. keeps it under in balance. Uh -huh. It's um it's an incredible whiskey and I think something that we were bouncing around with the members as well was food pairings. And um, I don't know if this is something you subscribe to, but uh, we have a lot of ideas from the members in the comments around. Would you pair this whiskey with anything? And if so, what would you pair it with? Well, I'm actually really interested to hear what the members have been bouncing around. What's the kind of suggestions that you've had for the food so far? Uh, we have had a bounty of shortbreads so far. We've got some... Don't get scared of talking about shortbread. It's a favourite. 
We've got chocolate birthday cake, which is terrific. I assume it's somebody's birthday, so happy birthday to you. Yeah, happy uh, birthday. <laughs> um, we have uh, we have some steamed beef buns. That's terrific. I think. Um, and you know this? That's probably the camp that I would more subscribe to is in the savoury part of Pernuski. Um, I actually think maybe cheeses, maybe a hot cheese, like a baked camembert um, mm. alongside this whiskey. Um, dried meats, I think, would work really well. But I'd really be interested in those beef buns because I think that could be a really nice balance. Definitely. Definitely. I think anything that with a strong peanut, that's, that's where it's going to fall in love. Um, I'm immediately hungry. <laughs> I'm asking that question. Um, I've got I've got a very good question here from Roman Blackwell, and it's again back to your kind of whiskey making philosophy. Uh, first of all, he says it's a delicious dram, which I hope is not unexpected feedback. I'd say that's been the chorus uh, thus far. But um, do you have a flavor profile in mind when you're putting together the whiskey, or do you kind of let it lead you as it's evolving? So I have an idea of what I want and then I will look at our stock and I will select the casks and then I will individually nose each of the casks and I will listen to what they've got to say. It's almost like, you know, if you're into sport and you've ever done any coaching and you want to pick a team, you know, mm. you look at everyone that you've got and you then decide which position they're going to go in and how long each one of them is going to play for. It's exactly the same because for me, each cask is like a person. Mm. When you put one cask, one cask, you think, well, oh, this is going to be great. But actually, it's too powerful. It's got too much to say and it dominates and spoils the others. Um, so, is it always right? Absolutely not. If it was, it would be boring, you know? You would, and that's where you try, try this way. Does that work? What's the pro what's the profile doing? Is it interesting enough? Does it reflect the house style? Do mm. Is there enough flavour in there? Um, is it balanced? All of those questions. But it's always very difficult because when you're making, you want to make something that you like. So to be, remove yourself from a situation and be objective and say, well, you know, in the height of summer, a really heavy spiced whiskey is not what I would want to drink, but actually in winter I would want it. So don't think about this roasting environment. Well, not roasting. <laughs> Semi-warm. <laughs> semi <laughs> when it's lovely weather, you know, I have to remove what would I like to drink right now and think about the flavouring. So d does it work? Do the flavors, regardless of preference, do they go through a really nice flow? Um, and I think that's always the hardest because I'm definitely a small whiskey drinker. So over the winter, I really love peaty whiskies. I'm really because I'm such a cliche. But I like to add a peated whiskey with a bag of Maltesers and oh. drink together. It's most delicious when we're on the food pairing chart. Um, and at this time of year, just as we're starting to move into spring, I love to drink green whiskey. Mm. I think green is really quite an underrated whiskey. Um, I'm a big fan. Yeah, that's terrific. I'm a, I, I'm a, a fan of that. I'm a fan of, honestly, anyone trying something that's slightly outside of the norm on whiskey, and, and that's incredible. Um, I, I have to ask more to the members, to be honest. Um, one of the fun things that we kind of get caught up in in Australia is we mirror a lot of whiskey culture in the UK and we'll inevitably start to get sherry cast Christmassy whiskies during summer because that's when they're all being launched and that's when they're all being created. And I want to know, members, if you want to see that or if you want to see us go, to heck with that, let's have our own Australian Christmas, let's just do rum casks. I mean... Let's um let's maybe make it our own. I, I want to see what you think. Oh, we find, we have a question from Ian Peter Allison. He's been the diehard man on the groups. Uh, it's it's a good question for you, Sarah. Uh, when is there a Lakes Peated whiskey coming? 
I can't be telling you all the secrets. You know, sometimes in life you have to wait for a surprise. I haven't even begun to ask hard questions. That was. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think if, if the question is, do we have peated stock maturing at the lakes? The answer to that is yes. Oh, terrific. Terrific. All right. Well, then I'll give you a slightly harder question. But again, from an Australian tilt, uh, we have a wonderful question here from Jesse Morgan. Uh, is there any possibility of a collaboration with an Australian distillery or winery? And I'll take that one step further. Do you have any Australian wine casks already in your warehouse? We, we might have some Australian wine casks in our warehouse. But see, in terms of collaboration, I'm probably more in a copycat mode because one of my favourite whiskies is the Star Wars Ginger Beer Whiskey. Like that, that is amazing. The effervescence on a palate, like I just think it's so much fun. And with us being in England, you know, we've got the opportunity to do something like that. So, you know, how how would Lake's ginger beer matured whiskey stand up against Star Wars? I think that could be a bit of fun. Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, that, that sounds incredible. And, um, you know, we've got a good relationship with Star Wars. So, um, We'll, uh, we'll make a call if you need. We can help in any way. <laughs> I'll, I'll pop over for that meeting, Seamus. <laughs> yeah, perfect. We'll hold you back. You've got to come down to Tassie as well, though. Excellent. <laughs> uh, I've got one more cast question here, and it's from Tim Hardman. Uh, always good, uh, always watching along. Um, have you done or are you planning some cognac cask finishes or some co cognac cask components in some of your whiskies? Because of our um, approach using Elevage, cognac yeah. is something that really is quite special to us. And we've got, we do have some cognac casks currently in the warehouse. Mm. Have we got to a place where it's right? Not quite yet. So I don't know how many more years that's going to take. Yeah. It's an exciting question because I think cognac casts have a habit of performing in some fairly unpredictable ways sometimes. So I'm I'm very excited to see that. I've got one more harder question for you, and it's it's a, a question that you very much can back out of. But uh, having heard your whiskey making philosophy and the way that you're approaching each of these drams, I would love to ask you: Had we told you that we were interested in the whiskey all of well all that time ago? and told you that it was going to be released in an Australian winter, how would you have approached this dram differently? I th I'm not sure that I would have approached it that much differently because I would have still wanted that same cars combination. Mm. Um, I think that was a really important part of this. Um, and... I think the the flavor the flavor profile and the way that it worked, I think, is just right. Absolutely, but that's quite a hard question because I always consider when you make a whiskey, it's like one of your children, right? So you love them, but you understand their faults, and that's almost like asking me, "Well, would you put this child back and replace it for another <laughs> one?" <laughs> well, I'm not going to ask you that then. That, that's <laughs> That off of my list that was going to be the next one but um, that never <laughs> um no it, it's it's been incredible i guess if if i could channel us in one last direction it would be what would you like to do next what would you like to tease is there any casks that you would love to play with that you haven't yet um i've got a number of new and unusual cast types arriving to the distillery um over the next one to two months and i'm really looking forward to seeing how they perform because do we find that with an exotic wood that we need to adjust our cast filling strength how does that conversation work mm. how long how long does it take so some of the the wood experts that i've been talking to have said that one of the wood types that we're bringing in that they would expect to see a transformation in a whiskey within one month. And I'm like, 
whoa, that is really fast. So we're going to have a crazy sampling regime around these new woods just to see what mm. actually happens. So it could be quite a hectic time in terms of bottling because it'll be very much now. <laughs> it needs to go. Yeah, very, very, very interesting. And knowing that you've you've played with some stout casts in the past at the distillery, I'd be interested to see if it's that kind of rapid maturation or more something around the tannin of the oak. But I shan't make you reveal. I'll behave. <laughs> I'll behave. Before we wrap up, um, and you guys, I, I think, know this, but the members certainly do, while there are no bottles left in the country of the Lakes Voyage, um, there is a few bottles left at the distillery in the UK. And what we will be doing is bringing them over on the next ship that we can. So before we wrap anything up, I would encourage anyone who fell in love with this whiskey and then thought, really should have gotten a second bottle, really should have gotten a third bottle, um, that uh, you should reach out to the team tonight, tomorrow, and make sure that you put yourself on the wait list. There's not an enormous amount, but for anyone who is interested, they will be on a ship and they will be arriving later this year. But more immediately, we have one more whiskey from the lakes up for release. And um, what must have been a year ago, we put aside some of the lakes whiskey makers reserve number five, uh, the sequel to the whiskey that won you world's best whiskey. Uh, I was wondering if you could give the members a little bit of a summary about what makes those whiskies different from the voyage. Whiskey Maker Reserve is a reflection of our house style. Mm. You know, it's our exploration into the world of sherry. And with each one of the additions, it explores and pushes a specific flavour further forward. And that range from one to seven is really what's influenced our house style and what will be the influence behind our permanent products for the future. Mm. Um, Kirsty has probably spent more time than anyone talking about Whiskey Maker Reserve, and she's had to stand for like a glamorous yeah. assistant. So I think Kirsty could chat about Whiskey Maker Reserve. So the Whiskey Maker's Reserve series, as, as Sarah says, it, it is a series. It's a series of releases. The one that you guys have got now is number five. This just so happens I've pulled out number four, which one is the world's best single malt at the World's Drinks Awards 2022, which we're incredibly proud of. Um, all of the, the, the series, I guess, is kind of like a reflection of that, that journey of a new distillery. Um, as Sarah said earlier, we do use this um, very interesting technique from the cognac industry called Elevage. So this was about um, it, it, predominantly the whole range. It's like a family. It's got common DNA. So they're like siblings, Okay, each, each release and each number. So mm. they've all predominantly been matured in a combination of European and American oak, predominantly seasoned with uh, PX Oloroso and red wine. But they've all been on this Elevage journey. And, and basically what Elevage is for, for those people that just haven't come across this concept before is rather than putting the spirit in the cask and leaving it for three, five, eight years, however many years you want to mature it, we actually take our spirit on a journey through different casks as it is maturing. So as it is maturing and aging, it's taking on these different characteristics from the oak type and the seasoning. Um, gives it that complex layers of flavour. And we believe it's the Whiskey Maker's Reserve that very much reflects that complexity and layering of flavouring. Um, hence, it is our kind of signature style as a distillery. Um, you get um, that kind of rich, uh, dark fruit characteristics that you would expect from the European oak. But you, it also has this kind of very soft, sort of overlay of, of toffee and caramel that you would expect to come through from the American oak. Um, each of the different releases have been on slightly different Elevage journey, so they do have their own personalities. They have that family DNA, but they distinctly have their own personalities because they've actually spent differing amounts of time in the different cask types that have been used in the style. So this is a, a much more... I guess sherry led um, characteristic of single malt that you would expect that dark rich fruit that lovely spice that comes from the European oak and the kind of backdrop of toffee and caramel. They're yeah. almost they're almost chewy, you know. They're that heavier, big wheat, big flavors, um, and quite recently 
um, we met some people from Nigeria and they recommended, because this is how they like to drink their whiskey, with Coke. We did Whiskey Maker Reserve Club with Coke, made a nice long drink, and knowing how much you guys like Bundy and Coke, I would <laughs> highly recommend when Whiskey Maker Reserve 5 and Coke, give it a go. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's incredible. And members, please, if you do create that when you get your bottles, tag the Whiskey Club, tag the legs. We want to see it on the socials because that is, I mean, if we're taking inspiration from Bundy and Coke, <laughs> I thought you would like that. <laughs> Absolutely loved it, and I'm horrified with how well you've read me straight away. But uh, I appreciate that. Look, guys, it's at the point where I, I think I get to wrap us up, um, but I get to wrap us up with a few parting messages. So, one, first of all, members, as always, for watching along and getting in the comments. Uh, we were giving away a bottle tonight, so Patricia Gad. I want to give massive congratulations to you. You've actually secured a bottle of the Whiskey Makers Reserve number five. So massive congratulations to you. For everyone else involved, a limited number of bottles will be going live in your accounts this coming weekend alongside the Glen Glasser Whiskey of the Month. Uh, that being a Pedro Jimenez matured age 12 years of age made by the legendary Dr. Rachel Barry as well. And for everyone who does get that bottle and everyone who's watched along tonight on the 26th of March, you can catch us there. Rachel and I will be catching up about that distillery, about that whiskey and answering all your geeky whiskey questions. But back to tonight, Sarah, Kirsty, if you had any parting thoughts for the members before we call it a night, please, we'd love to hear them. i just like to say thanks so much for buying a whiskey for appreciating the flavour and coming along and listening tonight. Enjoy the rest of your Lakes whiskies. Yeah. And, and it is very, very early days for us at the Lakes, not just in Australia, but we only released our first single malt in September 2019. So, you know, we're very proud and humbled at the success we've had to date, but it's only the very beginning. So it's exciting. And, and thank you very much and cheers to you all for joining us on our journey. Cheers. And cheers to you both for joining us tonight and members. Cheers to you all for watching along. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you for the next one. Good night. Cheers. cheers.